Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, first uh, webinar that we are organizing uh, in behalf of the CLARE network. Uh, CLARE has uh, been the largest uh, European grassroots that, uh, network organization of uh, AI research lab laboratories in, uh, in Europe. And uh, as uh, you, we all probably have been uh, very much involved uh, the last four months um, with uh, dealing with uh, the COVID-19 crisis, not only on a personal level, but also on a professional level. Um, it was uh, quickly clear for the Claire uh, Network to uh, start and organize ourselves. And then uh, there was a task force being set up uh, in uh, the month of March. And that's uh, the reason why we want to organize this uh, webinar to present you the results uh, out of this, uh, um, out of this uh, task force. Um, for that reason, we have uh, several speakers uh, uh, during this uh, webinar for you. Um, we will start off with uh, Emanuela Girardi. Uh, she's representing uh, uh, the Claire Rome office and is a member of the high level expert group on the AI of the Italian uh, government. And moreover, she was one of the driving forces of the uh, uh, task force COVID 19 within Claire. Um, next to, uh, to Emanuela, uh, we will have uh, Giovanni Stilo, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Information Engineering, Computer Science and Mathematics at the University of uh, L'Aquila, and he was a uh, topic coordinator on uh, the bioinformatics uh, 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 group within the task force of uh, CLARE. Uh, next uh, to uh, to him, uh, we are very happy to have an, uh, uh, somebody from, uh, from in industry, and uh, Andrea Bicari, who is a business unit uh, head of uh, Dombe Farmaceuti, uh, will react to, to also uh, the, the experience they, was, uh, they had um, um, over the past four months when dealing uh, with uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis and how technology could, uh, could help them. Um, another uh, uh, topic that we dealt with within the task force uh, was on uh, image analysis. Uh, and there we have the topic leader, Marco Aldinucci, who is going to uh, present some of the activities that uh, this uh, topic group uh, has been executing within the task force. Uh, he's a professor on the computer science department of the University of Torino. And we are also very happy, uh, lastly, to have uh, uh, Silvio Tosato uh, in our webinar. Um, he's uh, deputy head of the node of Elixir uh, Italy, and he's uh, also leading the machine learning uh, uh, expert group within the Elixir uh, network. Um, and we we'll also uh, explain how the Elixir uh, program has been contributing and has been working uh, within the COVID-19 uh, crisis uh, period. And of course, it is, for us, it was very important to have uh, not only our own people from the CLAIR network uh, be present in this, uh, in this webinar, but especially thanks to Silvio and uh, Andrea to be present uh, because uh, the CLAIR network is also reaching out uh, to industry, to other uh, European uh, uh, networks and other new European programs uh, to further collaborate and enhance the uh, opportunities of AI in uh, not only COVID-19 crisis, but of course also in other applications domains. But I would now uh, would like to give the floor to uh, Emanuela. Um, okay, Hans, Emanuela is in the waiting room. Can, can you please yes, admit Yes, of course. Her? Yes. And uh, from a practical reason, if you have questions uh, during the webinar, you can always drop them in the, the chat room and uh, then we will deal uh, with them later. Okay. So. See, Emanuela, did you manage to? Yes, hi everybody, and sorry, okay. but my computer crashed and I, I had to restart. Bad timing, it. no problem, no problem. With Zoom it happens quite often. So. Okay, so now the floor is yours, Emanuela, I just introduced you, so it's up to you to present. Okay, so thank you everybody, sorry I missed the introduction. So I don't know if you already presented Claire Hans, but... Um, Very briefly, yeah. Okay, well, so basically, um, CLARE is the biggest organization of researchers, uh, scientists, technologists, AI experts in the world. 
We have about uh, 3,300 um, members at the moment. They are coming from over 350 research institutions and research groups from about uh, 34 European countries. So basically with such a, a huge community of AI experts that are focused on developing uh, um, human-centric and trustworthy AI, when the pandemic hit Europe, what we thought was like, okay, with such a huge community, a huge community, I mean, we really need to do something to support the European government, health institutions, and doctors. And we really can do something, I mean, learning from what uh, um, Chinese, uh, China or other Eastern countries did using AI technology, using also AI technologies to help tackle the pandemic. So we decided to offer our support to Europe European governments, health institu institutions, and research groups. And what we did is that we launched a call to, to all our uh, community, AI expert community, and we were quickly able to, um, to gather, uh, I mean, to recruit very quickly about 150 uh, AI experts from the different fields of AI, and we started organizing them in seven research groups, topic groups. And basically, I mean, what this group did, they started working on these different topics. So basically from bioinformatics to medical image analysis to epidemiologist data analysis and so on. And the idea is that basically they were collecting and curating resources, leveraging AI techniques in the context of COVID-19 to support the development of uh, new projects or, or, or new uh, AI application in, uh, in the AI fields. So we already reached after, uh, so we have this ta task force on AI in COVID-19 with Finclair, and we, um, we reached some amazing results uh, in uh, each of these topic group, and today we will be able to listen to the amazing results reached by, by informatics and by um, image, medical image analysis. And we also learned a lot from this experience with Finclair. And um, I think that uh, really the, probably the most uh, interesting, the most important lessons that we, we could learn uh, by this experience uh, were first one, were two basically. So the first one is that uh, we definitely need a multidisciplinary approach when we are dealing with the AI project and the AI technologies. So basically, I mean, we need that AI researcher, they have to work closely together with the domain expert. And this is because they really, I mean, only in this way, they can develop a very efficient solution that can be useful for health institution and for governments. And the second I mean, key lesson that we learned from this experience is that basically we definitely need a better coordination in Europe to develop and share the best practice on AI and health. And this is because if we look, for instance, at some example like the, the contact tracing app, basically each European state develop its own app. And so if we could have worked together and built a, a single European app, probably it would have been much faster, much more efficient. It could have been used in each European country and, and so on. And so I think that learning from this experience that we were coordinating, um, collecting, coordinating and sharing all these uh, European projects on AI and COVID-19 is that we definitely need to develop uh, an AI ecosystem also for health. And this is because we can really do something using AI technology, something useful for improving the, the health of uh, European citizens. And I do believe that Claire can play um, a very important role. So this is also about the second phase. The first phase of, the, um, of our task force is about to finish because the urgency, I mean, at least for the moment of, on uh, uh, COVID-19 is, um, is finishing. And so we are really thinking about how we can develop the, the learned lessons uh, during the task force uh, into something more stable to give really, I mean, a concrete contribution to uh, the European landscape of AI, uh, leveraging on, uh, on clear AI communities. I think that if it's, uh, I mean, I, I could go on and speak for hours probably about the, the key learning, <laughs> the key lessons learned from the, the task force, but probably it, it makes more sense to listen to the, to the amazing outcomes that have been reached by um, the topic groups on uh, bioinformatics and on uh, medical image analysis.
So I give the floor back to Hans, uh, and if he, we want to start uh, with uh, probably with bioinformatics uh, and, uh, and yeah. listening to the results they reached in this topic group. Yes. Thank you, uh, Emanuela, for the introduction uh, and uh, indeed of, of explaining uh, how that the, uh, the task force uh, quickly grew uh, into a, a large community of, uh, of these 150 plus research across Europe who wanted to contribute. And one of these topics indeed was uh, on uh, bioinformatics and uh, Giovanni Stillo was indeed uh, so kind to, to lead that one. So Giovanni, please tell us uh, uh, to, uh, to how that the, the, this uh, initiative evolved. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm going to present some slides and uh, first of all I would like to thank Emanuela and Hans for their uh, uh, introduction and I would also like to thank uh, Davide Baciu that uh, basically is the main coordinator of uh, the bioinformatics uh, uh, task force. So I will go very quickly and uh, let me, okay. Yeah, um, basically the task force in bioinformatics is composed by an heterogeneous groups of people that is uh, more or less 20 active members across the Europe. And basically we, we started to work in together at the beginning of March. And how our uh, background knowledge and skills are mainly focused on the artificial intelligence, machine learning and data science, but we have also some uh, other people that came in from uh, and have some backgrounds uh, from analysis uh, in the omics data and also biomedical data. And as task force, we have uh, set up some some aim, some problem that we would like to, to solve. And some of them are for sure characterizing the disease or trying to understand from an analytical point of view, which are the most uh, important kind of interaction among the viruses the viruses and the and the the host the human in this case and we are like also to develop some kind of filtering and retrieval strategies to selecting uh, the more appropriate and effective drugs to to be uh, to be uh, used to fighting the covid-19 and also as well we would like to build some kind of predictive model on the genetic uh, features of the virus. So, but to be more effective, because uh, these groups uh, have uh, in mind to have, a, a, as a first goal, to have an impact uh, during the, the, the COVID, the first problem that we would like to solve was the drug repurposing problem. What it is, suppose that you have a million of tested and readily available drugs, which is the best way, which is the, more effective way to select the, the, the one to test. So the, the, the set of drugs that can be employed. And this is called in uh, literature as drug repurposing problem. And to solve this problem, basically you have to, on one point of, from, on the one hand, you need to prepare the data, the, and analyzing the omics data and as much as possible information that you can and then on top of that you need to build a model and test it and so uh, you need to first collect this uh, amount of data such as the protein protein networks or the human viral interactome and as well a list of possible drugs to to be analyzed and our approach it is mainly based on deep graph networks and network data analysis and the first outcome that we we realize that we need to do is to collect all the bioinformatic or k informatics uh, uh, data and since uh, this kind of data are not necessarily uh, easily and understandable and uh, are also spread across a lot of uh, uh, research institution or uh, companies that provide uh, clearly public available the data, we decide to collect them just in one place and uh, structuring them in a way that it is more easily uh, for other researchers across the Europe to start directly working on the problem without uh, uh, 
be worried to collect the data and do not spend a lot of time to collecting the data. So it is all the data are now, this is the, the first outcome that we have reached, uh, are all collected in just one place and are ready available. And, but to go through and to see which are, are those data, the data that we have uh, uh, collected in the detail, first of all, we have collected the protein-protein uh, interactome that basically it is a network of, that uh, collect the, the interaction among the proteins of, in this case, of the uh, human uh, system. And also we have other uh, information that characterize these proteins. And one of, of these information are the domains that are basically distincting functional uh, properties of the property of the proteins and families that characterize and group together the proteins and the pathways that basically it is a, an order series of uh, events that are going to transform the, the proteins and create some biological products. And we also collect uh, uh, on top of all this data the biological terms and concepts that are already available from the gene ontology on the web. And to conclude, we need also some information about the, the, the interaction among the drug and, and the humans, and some uh, information about the drug structure at very, uh, very detailed level. And since uh, there are uh, the chance that some drugs uh, have some adverse effect uh, if they are administered together, we also collect uh, the kind of interaction that drugs, one drugs have with another. And to conclude that we also collect all the possible disease in general and the virus that contains also the COVID-19 data related. And so at the end, what the, which is the, the outcome? The outcome, the main out, outcome is uh, that we have all this data just in one place. And this enables um, the bioinformatics researcher to start to working directly on the problem. And we do not decide to narrow too much this data. So these, uh, these data are selected for the problem, but are not too narrow. And uh, the results, so in this way, is uh, already available to be used primarily by computer scientists, by computational biologists, and by informatics scientists. Just to give an example of uh, the kind of data that we have collected, in this, uh, in this picture, we, we can see the interactom, so the the protein protein interaction, and it is limited to the part of the proteins that are infected possibly by the COVID-19. And clearly, each dot in the picture represents a protein, and a line among two dots represents an interaction among them. Just to conclude, the results is public available using a GitHub repository and uh, that you can easily access the data using also the QR code on the left part of the screen. And if you are more interested on a detailed description of the resources, uh, you can have direct access to the description, but the description is also contained in the repository. Thank you very much, and uh, I guess uh, I will uh, give the floor uh, to Hans back. Thank you, uh, Giovanni, uh, and uh, indeed uh, great to see how that uh, this is evolved. And of course, this is really, of course, uh, also of interest also for the pharmaceutical industry, and that's why the the reason that we uh, that we also wanted to to hear from from Andrea from uh, from uh, the company Rompe to see if uh, they uh, challenged also the similar type of, of of problems and how that from an industry perspective in in the R and D unit uh, there. They were uh, looking at, uh, at at the problems that there were similarities, or also maybe some some other 
uh, uh, problems that uh, that showed up, uh, which are maybe typical for uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies now, of course, in the rush towards uh, uh, the search for a vaccine. Uh, uh. So, Andrea, please uh, let me hear from uh, from you uh, how that you guys uh, uh, experienced that. Can you see my slides? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So first of all, I want to thank uh, you for uh, inviting me and present the, 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 the first results from uh, my project uh, and uh, the Disescalate for COV. Uh, and also I think it's uh, the previous speaker to have so clearly introduced the concept uh, of uh, repurposing. That uh, for sure in this kind uh, of situation uh, is the only answer, uh, I mean, in the first uh, year of the pandemic, because vaccine will arrive in definitely more than a year. So we have to focus on the attention of things that can uh, provide some support uh, uh, immediately. So first of all, uh, I want to spend some words on the consortium itself. So it's a, a, a EU uh, Horizon 2020 financed uh, uh, project involving more than uh, 18 partners uh, uh, around the, the, the Europe, quite well uh, represented in my opinion. And uh, now we, are, uh, we have more than 200 researchers involved in this project. The consortium is designed to be a fully integrated uh, drug discovery and development facility because we combine uh, the uh, design uh, and selection of drugs, uh, uh, mainly for repurposing in this space, uh, but we also have uh, experimental facility to uh, validate uh, in vitro and in vivo the finding of the computational simulation up to the design of the clinical trials. So first of all, I want to introduce why, in, uh, in our opinion, uh, computer simulation and artificial intelligence are so relevant uh, in this uh, uh, pandemic situation. Because uh, uh, I would like to remember that after uh, more than 400 uh, clinical trials uh, uh, performed uh, uh, globally, we just have uh, one or two molecules that works uh, only on a fraction of the population because the Rendesivir, that is the most advanced and reliable antiviral molecule, is active only in the 30% of the population, even if this is the best molecule we have at the moment. So try and error from clinical trials do not help so much in this kind of situation. So we have to rely on two different things. One is in the first six months span, this is the most critical one in my opinion on uh, wet lab experiments, so identify molecule from uh, experiment in vitro and in vivo, but uh, we have the drawback that uh, developing this assay and validating this assay will take uh, time. So for sure in the first three, four months uh, of the pandemic uh, crisis, uh, we don't have uh, proposed molecule from uh, wet lab and uh, experiments, just because we do not have the assay and the system ready. And then in the second phase, uh, then we arrive uh, validated assay, we can have uh, molecules that come out from these uh, uh, experiments that could be at least uh, have uh, um, I mean, a preclinical uh, validation uh, on, uh, on, in this case, on COVID. From the computerized uh, drug design and in general for all other uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence technique, uh, of course uh, we can, uh, I, I talk only for uh, our experience, but of course there are many, many different uh, ways to perform this. In our hands, uh, we start from uh, um, 3D homology models, so the reconstruction of the 3D structure of the, the, of the, molecule, of the viral proteins to identify uh, molecules from uh, similarity in the binding site target. 
So we are looking for molecules that by chance uh, interact with known targets on other uh, indi in indication, uh, in other, uh, for example, viral or antibiotic or other mechanism of action that by chance have a similar uh, pocket in, uh, in, the mo in, uh, in, in the protein, uh, in the viral uh, protein. Then uh, we are able to generate uh, validated uh, in silico validated virtual screening uh, procedures uh, and now we can look for molecule uh, we do not rely on uh, on the antiviral or the similarity in the cavities but uh, are able to interact effectively with the protein of the virus one one important point is quite different from other group we focus on the entire proteome of the virus so we analyze all the functional protein of the SARS-CoV-2 instead of focusing on one or two uh, protein at the same time. And uh, we think that is a, a more successful approach and I try to show why. So in this second phase, uh, we can uh, generate molecules uh, coming from virtual screening uh, experiment and can be suggested to be uh, used in, uh, in, uh, in clinical, uh, in clinical settings. And then we are in this phase now. We have a computer simulation supported by experimentally validated um, experimentally validated that, that can then be uh, assess the quality and the performance of the molecule and select the molecule that are really active in vitro and in vivo for uh, further characterization. So the real point here, at, at least for us, is how can we rely on machine learning to identify usable drugs? Because in this situation, we have to skip a lot of phases that normally are involved in clinical trials, just because of the time uh, and the hurry to produce a, a solution and therapeutics to the population. So I will start with some example of the performance of uh, computer simulation validated by experimental results. So in this case, using our in silico polypharmacology profile, we were able to identify five out of 24 molecules experimentally uh, identified at, as inhibitors of the viral replication. That is a quite remarkable uh, results in our, in, our, in our understanding. And now we will use this information of the molecule that we do not catch in the first run to optimize the model and tend to have enhanced models able to identify additional compounds we miss in the first case. Now I want to report the, the case has already been released to the public as information, the raloxifene molecule. It is a repurposed drug from osteoporosis that uh, we found uh, quite at the same time with the uh, South Korean government uh, as uh, uh, a potential uh, uh, treatment for, for COVID. So in this case, we combine uh, uh, in silico polypharmacology prediction with uh, system morphology and uh, disease modeling of uh, the mechanism of action on the host sites, on the human sites, of the, of the molecule itself, uh, and also extraction of knowledge from literature, because raloxifene is already identified as a potential uh, um, treatment for other uh, uh, viral uh, pandemic in the past. Then we combine all this information in a short list of compounds, then, then we experimentally validate in different uh, assay, mainly in the viral replication so in this case, uh, we are able to validate uh, our findings with uh, the raloxifene, and now we are in the phase of design uh, a phase two A clinical trials uh, to validate uh, on in, uh, in clinics the results we found uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this project. Just to mention that other groups use a completely different approach. This is a, a paper from uh, uh, Benevolent AI that uh, immediately after the pandemic, uh, the very beginning of February, was able using uh, uh, computer simulation and machine learning to identify other possible molecules uh, in a completely independent way uh, respect to the, the, the action we have, 
to use it. So these tools are really important to suggest molecules where no other clue are available and where no clinical data are, uh, are available. Very rapidly, I want to go to some points of important uh, uh, already mentioned on the lesson learned from this pandemic. And for sure, I want to point out that we have to uh, monitor potential risk in the future, just to be prepared before the development of a pandemic. For example, is another uh, high level risk at the moment for another virus, and we already are working on that, just to be prepared in case. To use uh, any of these results just because will not be the case, but uh, we won't be prepared for uh, for future pandemics. Uh, just monitoring uh, the, the the incoming issues. Another important thing is that uh, anything that we find on the computer is useless if we do not have uh, molecule and sample to test. So I just want to mention that we have only available in Europe the 30 percent only the 30% of the 10,000 molecules uh, that are uh, in clinical trials uh, or uh, on the market. We have to solve this in the future because uh, this is really reducing uh, our possibility to exploit the results of the molecular simulation uh, and machine learning techniques uh, if we don't have the sample to test. More on that, we have less than 1% of the nutraceuticals, uh, and I just want to point out that bacalein is a nanomolar inhibitor of uh, one of the main proteins of the virus. Uh, it is already on the market as a food supplement. And this is an example that uh, we can uh, take compounds uh, and, and useful treatments uh, also from, uh, from food, the nutraceuticals, and natural proteins that are. Uh, really less, less variable than the drug to, to test. Second, and this is one important uh, thing from uh, the computer simulation uh, story, is that we need uh, to combine all the techniques. For example, I heard from uh, Giovanni a completely different approach in uh, addressing the problem. And I'm sure that combining uh, their information with our uh, techniques, uh, we can only advance uh, and augment the chance to find uh, uh, novel treatment faster. We haven't done because we don't have the knowledge and we don't have in place a network to immediately access to additional competence on this. In the future, we have to start to thinking how to complement all the possible approaches that bring uh, a piece of the information on uh, on a global system to have uh, the fastest and more reliable answer because we have to arrive to the clinics with the shortest and the lowest number of molecules with the highest chance to be uh, active and not waste more than 400 clinical trials on uh, uh, wishful thinking of clinician uh, in most of the case without any validation or any clue on the real mechanism we are trying to, to, to address. So the time is finished. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And this is my book. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. I think uh, it's uh, very good to see that indeed the, uh, the approaches can be, can be deferred and that uh, the challenges ahead and, and the warnings that we have to take into mind to, to look for the future is, uh, it is still, uh, we're still not there eh, to, 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 to uh, summarize it like that. Uh, again, if people have, uh, have questions, you can drop it in the, in the chat. Uh, uh, for later on, I think uh, an, another example of uh, um, the uh, the task forces, uh, the task force COVID nineteen activities within Clare, uh, was also related to uh, the image analysis uh, uh, um, uh, challenges that were uh, everywhere occurring. I think across Europe in the, in the different hospitals, uh, where quickly has uh, has been seen that uh, making use of CT scans. Uh, and combining this with, with already uh, different models on, on, uh, on uh, image analysis uh, could pay off. And uh, I'm very happy to, to give the words and the floor to, uh, to Marco uh, Aldinucci to, uh, to explain uh, his uh, experiences that he uh, So Marco, please uh, go ahead. Thanks, Hans. Can, can you hear me well? Yes, okay, good. So I'm Marco Aldinucci from University of Turin and um, I coordinate in the 
uh, <coughs> task force on medical images. We started uh, in uh, more or less 50 people. Uh, honestly, we may have uh, half of them that are still active, but uh, that was expected. So I'm originally from uh, parallel computing. So the, I got this task of coordination with the idea of sooner or later uh, going toward uh, bridging AI experience with uh, my personal experience that is HPC and this is the plan for today. So I'm going to quickly tell you what we are doing now in the group that we are basically benchmarking the uh, current uh, state of the art methods for diagnosis using medical images and AI. In particular, we, uh, so when, uh, when in March, uh, February, COVID came out, methods, AI methods pop up as mushroom during the night. So at a certain point, we all asked us, okay, but are they really working? Can we compare one each other? And from this, uh, most of the people agreed that one of the activities we could do is really trying to find a methodology to compare them and to find them what, uh, uh, one against the other, so what is the most successful and uh, how we can also optimize them or improve them without uh, uh, having a sort of a number of uncomparable, uncomparable approaches. That, uh, let, let me say we are all scientists and we interpret this as scientists. We, we just go uh, really uh, comparing scientifically things and then maybe uh, writing a, a paper on that. I'll go through quickly after all the other two points that are the existing projects on that area that were already uh, existing. So we will try to incorporate and to invite people uh, participating to, to the group. And uh, in the third point, uh, how we um, uh, design the world we thinking to bridge HPC and AI. So there, there are two types, okay? There are two types. And they don't know, but they, they are friends, but maybe four because they uh, attempt to ignore one each other, but they really need one each other. And that's uh, uh, putting them together is not as easy as uh, uh, putting them in the same slide. Okay, that's uh, something we, we have to talk about. Okay, so let, let us, let me start with uh, benchmarking. So uh, what we did here for benchmarking, we try to, to follow a pipeline, even in the organization of the group and in the scientific work. So we try to make everything very, very uh, repro reproducible, okay? So we organize this way. We first collect uh, the uh, state-of-the-art models on 2D images that apply both to uh, TC scan slices and X-ray. And uh, we try to uh, embed that model in a novel pipeline that is able to express all of them and generalize all of them and is able also to um, improve them by adding uh, pre-processing or post-processing stages that aim either to improve sensitivity or improve interpretability. It means explanation of the results. So for this, uh, starting from basically image classification method, we extended them by uh, adding stages uh, aiming to self-training uh, uh, self -training, uh, the images and boosting boosting the, the uh, classification and also uh, putting in it uh, uh, an ingredient that is uh, interpretably by design, meaning that uh, the network we are training are mostly uh, training on the future we can explain. Okay, that, that's the point. Um, then what we did is to, uh, we plug it in the state of the art model. So this is the, conceptual pipeline that is pre-processing, augmentation, segmentation, classification, boosting and interpretation, where we basically put, plug in the state of the art medal in the classification stage and in the other stage. And then we, we have so basically a big Cartesian product of uh, different training methods. And we train all of them by using supercomputing. That's what we do, okay? 
So at the end of the story, we, we are using in that particular case, supercomputing to explore a really broad, broad range of possibility and compare all of them all together quickly. So we got an implementation uh, uh, workflow. C can you see my slide moving on or not? Because I, I got the impression that, uh, no, sorry. So uh, <laughs> please tell me because uh, can, can you see now? Okay, so I was trying to move the slide, but uh, for some reason uh, uh, they don't move. So that, that was the second I showed, that's the third. And uh, uh, so I was talking over that. And that's the pipeline I, I were talking about. So I'm sorry, but I didn't realize that, uh, that the slide didn't move. And uh, uh, so uh, we publish everything. So we, we create a GitHub in where we put all the code. There is a lively GitHub, it's still private, but we'll, it's going to open very soon, as soon as we have some stable result. Uh, and this work has been really collective. We organized in subgroup. There have been many, many people working uh, on different parts of the pipeline that are uh, mentioned. There were uh, a number of people that are mentioned here uh, from uh, different institutions, uh, University of Torino, Catania, Bucharest, Lancaster, and so on and so forth. And uh, for uh, working and comparing um, methods we adopted uh, we adopted a large data set that is current one of the most of the largest currently known in that area that has been offered by through the deep health project by Fisabio that include uh, uh, over uh, 3000 x-ray and over uh, 200 uh, over 200 uh, slice this is scan that are both covid and non covid taken from uh, 1,300 1, COVID different uh, individual uh, patients, okay? Uh, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, so we got some preliminary results. We selected 25 model uh, from the literature and we um, evaluating them with all the variants. So the, the search space is really large because even without uh, changing the variants in the pre-processing, we are still at many different models to be trained. And uh, uh, we are comparing them using a single pipeline and uh, with good result because we, we currently have with really a preliminary work uh, already at over 90 90 percent of sensitivity and about 90 percent of sensitivity and specificity here honestly the technique i wouldn't like to uh, spend too much time on that but really the real hard work is not that training but is uh, to define a pipeline that is able to train uh, 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 to train with uh, small data, because 1,300 patients are still small data. In that case, most of the AI methods simply overfit. So we did a sort of uh, a lot of work for avoiding overfitting, having a good uh, properties. So uh, time is running, so I should go on. That's what we are doing. And we are doing using supercomputer, and we are uh, uh, relate. We are in relation with other big initiatives. One of those is the TDPL project. That is, you find the IC, ICT11 project. This 50 million euro project uh, that uh, has and is, is central in that sense because it aim at uh, using AI for medical images. And there is now uh, the mid of the project, 18 months. And uh, uh, the very crucial thing for European community in the project is, is uh, shown by the arrow. So we are developing an entirely European approach to machine learning. Machine learning is a value. Interpretability is a value. It's very difficult to understand to understand the network if you don't dominate the full stack. From the data to the code, on how do you do the training? If you take everything, you push on the Microsoft Cloud and you get the result, then you have to understand what is the precision, what is many things. So in Deep Health, we, we started from 
another viewpoint. Uh, let me go on. Another project I would like to mention is the, this is happening in Turin. I mentioned it because we recently received from, uh, as a gift from the European community, one of the machine that is called infrared CP Lang. There have been distributed 10 in Europe. And this is a fully automated machinery for diagnosis, it's a TC scan with a full diagnosis that is built by a company. So something we are doing in Turin in collaboration with the hospital is, is trying, is making uh, trials uh, together from computer science department and, uh, and the hospital to understand how it works. Uh, and and uh, let me pass through the, the last uh, topic that is uh, HPC. I have still maybe over two minutes, so that will be enough. Let me start simply. Italy is, uh, I'm Italian and most of the people are Italian, is today uh, the fourth nation in the world for uh, compute power. Okay, that's the first time it happened. But uh, the good news is that if you sum up, Italy, France, Germany, and so on and so forth, Europe, you get a bar that is almost equivalent to the others. So we are really uh, 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 in a good shape today. And so uh, there are uh, one aspect that is crucial. Today, supercomputers are built with GPUs. Many GPUs, how many? One modern supercomputer could have 12,000 GPUs, okay? So there is basically no application that can use them altogether, apart machine learning. So one natural thing to, to, to do is use them for machine learning. Okay? But machine learning people are not really ready to use it because they have entirely different uh, background, entirely different uh, um, way of expressing and doing things. I, I try to summarize the difference, but I, I can talk for hours on that because it's really my, it's my topic, but I would like to, to skip them. Simply for supercomputer people, data is not a big value. They, they share, it's public. For AI people, it's not. For one is the input, for the other is the output. And for uh, AI people, data movement is much more important than flops. Whereas for simulation or HPC, in what, even what uh, uh, has been shown by Dompe is, is, uh, is basically based on flop, not on data movement. They just doing a lot of compute. Okay, so it's different, it's different thing. So what we uh, try to do using our own approach is to uh, uh, conceptualize the idea of workflow we define and say, okay, let us make it so portable that can be executed together in the cloud and in an HPC machine, and not really with a co-design approach that is the typical HPC, but making it as portable, as, as much as portable as possible. We would really to plug in your method, your machine learning method in the right place and make it working on a supercomputer. That's our task. For this, we, uh, and that's the last slide, uh, we are uh, signing today or maybe tomorrow, I'm not sure, uh, a, a new uh, memorandum of understanding that is from Claire and the uh, is a big data association that collects Cineca, this is the, the largest supercomputing center in, in Italy, the NFN, uh, Enea and many others, and that basically supercomputing providers Claire and the consortium of Italian National uh, for, for Informatics, that is another big consortium, trying to develop specifically this point, how to make supercomputing really usable by AI research. So we are starting today and we hope to, uh, we can extend our model to, uh, to you. That's hoping that Claire will support uh, us on this. That's, uh, that's okay. I, I hope I am quite in no, time. No, it's okay. Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Marco. And indeed, uh, I think, uh, as you have said so earlier, the challenges I had on, on using uh, HPC in uh, infrastructure across Europe. And uh, it's going to be the, the, the next challenge. And I think this memorandum of understanding will, will actually be uh, also a step uh, towards that to bring uh, AI researchers together with the uh, HPC infrastructure across, uh, across Europe. So th many thanks for that. Um, to, to move on and to, to give the floor to the last speaker, 
uh, for us as Claire, it was also important to reach out to, to already established uh, uh, European programs uh, that are out there. And the, the task force on COVID-19 is a, a, a ad hoc, uh, a new task force that has been established. But of course, uh, a research project like explained by, by Andrea or uh, established programs like Elixir, uh, of course, uh, uh, um, already could uh, could rely on an on an organization on a network, uh, and it was for us important to also reach out to Exilir, Exilir, Elixir, sorry, to uh, to ask them to to share with you the audience uh, the experiences they have had, and we are very happy to have uh, uh, Professor Silvio Tosato, uh, who is heading the machine learning uh, uh, group within Elixir. To share his uh, um, his experiences of the last uh, four months. So, uh, uh, please, Silvio, the floor is yours. So, thank you very much. And um, first of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, represent Elixir here today um, with this Claire meeting. Um, so, just to be clear, um, I will start off by explaining what Elixir is, because I cannot assume that necessarily everybody will, will be familiar with this. Elixir is um, a uh, large uh, ASPRI infrastructure. It's in fact an ASPRI landmark, and it, um, which means that it's um, European infrastructure for uh, biological data. And it covers 22 different member countries and over 220 different host institutions. So it's a pretty large consortium involving many people. It is organized around a series of five platforms which cover data, tools, compute, training, and interoperability. And it has uh, over 10 different user communities which are specific for applying or using the infrastructure for um, different uh, types of um, applications ranging from plant science to human data uh, microbial biotechnology and also some technological items like Galaxy, for instance, or some more specific topics like uh, the intrinsically disordered proteins. So um, Elixir is a large structure and um, more recently, since last year essentially, it has been also developing a series of um, focus groups. And um, I'm representing the, the, the machine learning focus group here today. So regarding the support Elixir gives to the COVID-19 research, well, this is um, broadly captured in the COVID-19 data portal. Uh, you see the link on, on the slide. And um, since Elixir is involved with um, the sharing and the open, and the open science uh, regarding biological data, um, it has been working mainly to um, help potential users to find the database where to store the data, access the relevant data for COVID-19, make the data easier to find and share, uh, find the right software and workflows to analyze the data, the, the, find the computing resources necessary to do this, um, contribute to um, the overall work of Elixir's members towards kind of COVID-19, and um, finding the publications regarding COVID-19 from Elixir members and various so, uh, services offered by the European infrastructures. So if you're interested in uh, the kind of data which is available, and the, the good thing about Elixir is that it is an integrated resource, where an um, integrated infrastructure, sorry, where um, the data can be freely shared and it's available and, and it can be moved in different forms. So it's, Elixir is fully committed to the FAIR principles, to make the data um, really useful um, and reproducible. So regarding machine learning, reproducibility is the key question which has been so far addressed in um, the machine learning focus group. And this uh, stems uh, in a good measure from a um, comment which was published uh, last year during the summer in uh, Nature Reviews Molecular and Cell Biology by David Jones. Um, was, uh, yeah, the title of this comment was Setting the Standards for Machine Learning in Biology. And essentially what this brief piece argues is that there are a lot of um, methods out there, a lot of public scientific publications regarding machine learning and artificial intelligence in general, but that we need to, se uh, to settle for more specific standards in order to make the, the, the actual works 
truly reproducible and to allow also the potential users of those machine learning methods and the reviewers of the papers which will be published uh, fully aware of the um, potential caveats of the methods but also make them fully appreciate the, 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 the positive sides of the method and what was um, uh, done uh, in the according to the best practices. So after an initial discussion and the, the machine learning focus group in Elixir came to, together right after this um, review paper was, was published, um, we had a longer, uh, longer discussion and eventually we came up with um, a proposal which is called DOME, which is another acronym which stands for Data Optimization Model and Evaluation. And this is our take on a series of recommendations in order to improve the reproducibility and the validation of machine learning specifically for bioinformatics. So what we are dealing with here is um, the, the purely the bioinformatics where you have different levels, be this the cell, the genome, the proteome, or things like the metabolism. And in order to clarify what should be expected of a good machine learning paper in order to um, be fully reproducible and allow the readers to make an informed decision about how good the method really is. So uh, DOME stands for Data Optimization Model and Evaluation. It's an acronym. It is contained in a paper which we have, been, um, which, which we have written and which is currently under review uh, with a journal and the preprint is available from the link you see it there in, in archive. So let me show you briefly uh, what each of those four letters means and or how this can be of relevance for machine learning. So the data part component here would be uh, related to the provenance, the data splits, the redundancy between the data splits and the availability of the data. So uh, on the bottom part, you see a number of questions which we have associated with each of these elements. And uh, essentially what we would like to guide is uh, the writing of an extended materials and methods section, which could be, for instance, in a supplementary material of a paper, where the, de uh, the, the authors describe all the details, if I may add, all the gory details of the machine learning method they have been using, and so that they make it fully available and fully trans transparent so that people can be judging it for their uh, own value. So the data component is really mostly about um, the data sets being used and how they have been treated. The optimization uh, stands for the algorithm being chosen, uh, whether we're dealing with meta predictions, which are quite popular in bioinformatics, how the data encoding is done, how the parameters, features, and fitting are um, processed, and whether the configuration is available. So one of the things we have been um, emphasizing with these recommendations is also that the various at various levels, uh, the data should be available. So for instance, the configuration files uh, should be available. And this will allow then the, the potential user to appreciate better the benefits of the method. So the model component is related to the interpretability of the model itself. This is a, a topic which is currently widely discussed in the community. So it pits on one hand very simple models which can have biophysical interpretations but maybe a very crude approximation versus at the other extreme the deep learning methods where you're essentially dealing with a black box and um, by using these, these advanced machine learning techniques you usually gain benefits because they were you, you can gain extra performance but at the same time it should be clear to the readers that the interpret interpretability of these black boxes may be um, compromised in certain cases or in other cases it may be difficult to actually judge what exactly was going on in the model itself. And also in this and in other uh, points um, our position is that we are being agnostic so we are just highlighting what questions should be answered. We are not taking sides and arguing whether it's better to use a black box or a, or a simple method but rather uh, our position is that it should be spelled out clearly in the method description. Then some additional information about the execution time and also the availability of the software are important for this component. And finally, we have the evaluation where a few important points are the actual method being used for the, evalu for the evaluation, 
So uh, are we dealing with cross-validation, independent data set, novel experiments, or how is this being carried out? What are the performance measures? And obviously, having more performance measures is a better uh, description of, the of how the method works than having just one of them. A comparison to other available methods is also very important in bioinformatics and something that should be carried out. Uh, stating the confidence you can have for um, the matrix which have been used and whether the differences between the method being described and other available methods are really statistically significant. And finally, the availability of the evaluation. So are the raw evaluation files available? If so, where and is this component also reproducible? Ultimately, what we are arguing for is the creation of a sort of summary table for machine learning, which should be incorporated in um, publications so that the interested reader can really uh, see all the details and judge for themselves how good um, these have been uh, carried out and how reasonable it is for, for machine learning. So finally, um, just to say about the, the Elixir Machine Learning Focus Group, this has been very active over the last year. The paper on the DOME recommendation is the first thing we have been uh, doing. We already have a number of other ideas on things we would like to do. Uh, the focus group is open to non-Elixir members. And one of our specific aims is to encourage the adoption of the DOME recommendations also for uh, other different fields and uh, to improve the capacity building around machine learning in the life sciences. So we are very interested in uh, hearing from you if you're, um, if you're dealing with bioinformatics in the widest sense or with biological data, and you would like to be involved with the machine learning focus group, then uh, please do get in touch. Um, there is more information about this on the Elixir website, and we have a dedicated machine learning focus group website, uh, sorry, mailing list, which is also um, available. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you, uh, Silvio. Uh, thank you very much. And, and also, I would like to thank uh, all of you uh, uh, being present uh, as a presenter to, to actually be very much in time and to keep us on, uh, more or less on, on schedule. Um, if there are some questions out of the audience, um, I would be really happy to, to join. There were some practical questions relating uh, the availability of the, the slides and recording of the webinar. Uh, but if you have uh, some questions for one of our speakers, uh, I would like to grab maybe an additional five minutes of everybody's time to maybe address them to, uh, to one of our, our uh, uh, presenters. Uh, so um, if uh, looking a little bit here in the chat, So um, maybe a, a question for um, uh, Marco and uh, and uh, uh, Emanuela. Uh, if uh, if we look at uh, the memorandum of understanding on the HPC uh, uh, infrastructure and, and making it available for uh, um, for the AI research community across Europe, um, how do you uh, think that that a potential next step would be to reach out to other HPC uh, uh, infrastructures uh, out there? Yeah. Well, um, th there is something that in, in the group we, uh, we already did, that I didn't mention because of time. Mm -hmm. So what we did is to directly contact uh, ai for You, that is the AI platform on demand, and directly contact EuroHPC and Praise, that is the network of supercomputing in Europe, to try to make them together. There is not something that is going to happen tomorrow, but it's something we as, uh, as Claire, we are doing. As you know, Claire is participating together with PDVA, EuroHPC, and many others to, uh, um, cooperation of activities that also involve ATP for HPC. And I think that, I would interpret that the memorandum of understanding as a pilot. Yeah. Okay. If it works, I think we will very relaxedly as Claire going in that table where there is EuroHPC, BDVA and others, AI community and say, okay, we did something that worked out. It is free. Yeah. Would you like to adopt? <laughs> that's yeah. that's, <laughs> that's nice. my current plan. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. 
Okay, maybe somebody else, another question? And if not, uh, of course, uh, uh, I would really uh, invite uh, all of you to, to maybe uh, have a revision of, of, uh, of the webinar once we make it available. Uh, we're also going to see if we can uh, uh, present to you the, the slides that our presenters have been, uh, have been able to make. And um, if there are no further questions uh, for now, then uh, I would really like everybody to be present and uh, uh, for those who are still uh, um, entitled to, uh, to go on a holiday, I would uh, wish you a very good and uh, relaxing summer holiday uh, over the upcoming uh, weeks. And uh, hopefully we can talk to each other in a, a better circumstances uh, in the near future and I hope to, to be able to collaborate with uh, many of you uh, later on in uh, other projects. Thank you very much everybody and uh, hope to uh, see you soon. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Hans and Manuela for organizing. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you all for the organization. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.